Well, this morning, aren't you glad you're back in the house of the Lord? Would you stand with us as we all worship together? for the wonder working power of the blood amen. amen look at somebody close to you and say there's power in the blood 
No, they didn't hear you say, there's still power in the blood. Tell them now. I'm telling you, that's what's enabled you to be here as a follower of Christ, is the power in the blood. What, what has brought about your forgiveness and adoption into the family of God is the power of the blood. That's what's made you who you are. Your identity being holy in Christ, it's the power of the blood. And it's wonder-working power. I mean, it was a wonder-working power that got me to where I am right now. From where I was to where I am, I want you to know it takes a wonder-working power. And it did the same for you too, and you know it. You know it. And guys, if you're wondering, she knows it too. She knows it was the work of God in your life. And I want you to know, that's what we get to celebrate and rejoice in when we show up to worship on a Sunday morning. That's what we get to do. I, I'm not here. There's no wonder-working power at, on my own. There's no wonder-working capability that I have. I, I can't conjure up some salvation from myself. I'm, I'm here to recognize that it's just Jesus. That everything that I have, every good thing about me is because of Jesus Christ. And we get to come in here and, you know, we're all different. We look different. we got different lives going on. we got different hobbies, different interests. We live in different homes. We drive different cars, wear different clothes. But when we come in here, I'm telling you, we got something in common. The power of the blood. We've got that in common. Every single believer in here, you have that in common. You've been washed because Jesus took your place. You've been cleansed because Jesus took your punishment. You've been forgiven because the wrath of God was poured out on Him. And so I don't come in here to make something of myself, but I come in here determined to make something of Jesus. I want to make much of Jesus. I want to honor Jesus, don't you? You got up early this morning to come to church. I, you, are, you must want to honor the Lord. You don't show up to church at 820 just to do something because you don't have anything better to do. You want to honor the Lord, no doubt about it. Amen? You honor the Lord. Amen. Amen. I want us to spend some time together in prayer uh, this morning. And I, we're getting ready to come up here to the altar. And I, I just want to do this. And I don't do this every Sunday. Uh, I'm, I'm not a routine guy like that. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a here's exactly how this is going to work. I just, I like for the Holy Spirit of God to lead. Um, but the Lord's impressing on my heart to, to make it available for anybody that wants um, I've got my bottle of anointing oil with me, and I would consider it an honor. Uh, if you would like to be anointed with oil uh, while people are coming up, I'm going to just stand right over here. And so as we're all getting ready to come down and pray, right, if you would like to have that uh, done as a part of this time together, then I just want you to come over and stand right there with me, and that will let me know. But I, I want you to know that this is biblical. You know, prayer is a gift from God. I want you to know that. Prayer is a gift from God. And prayer allows us, those made in God's image and saved by God's grace, to communicate with Him. And He wants us to communicate with Him. And the Bible says that we can cry out in our time of trouble. I believe that. You can cry out in your time of trouble. Now, whether that trouble is something you've got going on in a relationship or something you've got going on inside your body, something that's going on with, with your mind, maybe your emotions, some instability. Whatever that is, you can cry out in time of trouble. And the Bible says, and he will hear you. The Bible says, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking to show himself strong on the behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. He wants to show himself strong. One of the hardest things for a Christian to understand, even after salvation, I'm talking about somebody that's been born again, one of the hardest things for a Christian to accept is that God wants to. You're all the time thinking about why God doesn't want to. You're all the time giving yourself and him reasons for not doing something. But one of the best things you'll ever break through in understanding is your, in your faith is that God wants to. He's a want to God. He's not a have to God. He's not a, I guess, because I promised it in the Word, God. He's a want to God. He's looking, the Bible says, to show himself strong. I'm not looking for him first. He's looking for me. I don't have better intentions than the one who created me. I, I promise you that his heart is purer than your heart. His desires are perfect. He's a want to God. I want to build somebody up in their faith a little bit before you come down here and get anointed with oil because the reason we do this is because we believe the Bible. 
I'm not worried about what other people believe. I believe the Bible. And the Bible says that God is honored by someone who steps forward and says, I want you to anoint me, recognizing that that is a symbol of the power of God at work in my life. And I believe God to work in my life because I know He's a want-to God. I'm not trying to twist God's arm to help me out. How much we make of ourselves to put us in that position where we're the ones with this noble desire to do something well and we just need God's assistance. Are you kidding me? He's an awesome, perfect, holy, and noble God. If anybody's in the right position, it's Him. And we are crying out to Him. Lord, I am committing myself to you and where you are in your heart, in your desires. And I am trusting you, God. I'm not asking for your assistance. I am coming to you as your child. And I'm crying out to you in my time of trouble. That's what needs to happen. The Lord's impressed this on me for some reason, no doubt about it. Go ahead and start to play for us, brother. And I just want us to come down, get at the altar. And if you want to be anointed, I want you to come right here to me.
How about this? Before we finish, let's pray for one big thing. You get to determine what the big thing is, but I want you to pick something big out and pray for it. And I want you to know that while you are praying for that big thing, the people next to you are doing the same. I want you to be encouraged in your faith and knowing that you're not the only one that believes God for doing something big. I want you to get built up, Christian. Just go ahead and get strengthened in your most holy faith. And trust God for something big. And it doesn't matter whether or not anybody else thinks it's a big deal. If it's big to you, you bring it to God. If it's a big need or a big desire or a big problem, you bring it to God. And you say, well, I've prayed about it before. Well, amen. Keep praying. Keep trusting. Believe His promises. Believe His Word. There's going to be some pushback, Christian. Faith isn't easy. That's why the Bible calls this life a battle. Forces of darkness wanting to work against God doing anything in your life. And you've got to push through by faith. You got to keep believing by faith. Don't you give up. Lord, here I am again, and here it is again. But I don't have anywhere to go with it. I don't have anybody else to give it to. Who else can help me in this time? Who else can handle this problem? Who else can deal with this thing? Who else is able? It's just you, God. You see, Christian, you really don't have any other options but to give it to God. You can't carry it. It's too heavy. You can't do it. You're not able. You better keep trusting Him. You just keep giving it to Him. You know, He's honored by that consistency. I want you to know something. He's honored by somebody that treats Him well. That doesn't just come to me and slap their hands and say, Give me something quick, God. But somebody willing to bring him a need. Somebody willing to trust him day in and day out. Somebody willing to take him for his promises. Not one time, but several times. You see, God responds to that. That's faith, my friend. And he responds to it. Father, I just want to pray in agreement with my brothers and sisters in Christ now who are bearing their burdens. They're praying about something big. And Father, I pray that as they consistently walk this out by trusting you, Lord, that they, that they don't take back the problem, Lord, but that they lay it in your hands and that they trust you with it. Father, I pray that you would show yourself strong because that's what loyalty looks like. Continued trust. Continued faith. Father, we're trying to learn this. It doesn't come natural to us. We're, we're conditioned by the world around us to want something once and to get it immediately. We're conditioned to treat our faith and our relationship with you as being just that cheap. Where there's no depth, just demands. But Father, I don't want to walk like that with you. I don't want my relationship with you based on what I get from you. I want to walk with you in love I want to walk with you in surrender. I want to walk with you in trust. And then, Lord, during the times when I am in need, I'm just going to cry out because you're right there. So that you, the strong one, can come to my rescue. 
Because, Lord, when it's all said and done, even out of the needs that I have, even out of the burdens that I bear, even with the problems that I face, I want you to get the glory. I want you to be exalted. And so, Lord, the reason why we pray big things is because we've got big faith, big trust. We believe you and your word, your promises. And can I just say thank you, Father? Thank you for graciously responding to your people in need. Thank you for helping us and aiding us. Thank you for empowering us. We honor you. We love you. We cherish you. We adore you. And we pray everything, Jesus, in your wonderful holy name. Amen and amen. 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 As you make your way back to your seats, just go ahead and prepare to worship a little bit more. That's what we're here to do, to worship the Lord. Here I am to bow down Here I am to 
Just take a minute and just think upon the Lord. Just worship Him in our hearts. Just let Him work just for a minute. Praise His holy name.
church. Give him some praise this morning. He's worthy. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You know, I got a little praise in my heart this morning. How about you? You, you want to praise the Lord. Amen. I mean, heaven's praising the Lord. I want to praise the Lord. The people that know Him want to praise Him. The people that love Him want to praise Him. The people that He's changed and transformed, I can't help but want to praise Him. And I'm thankful that one day He is going to come for me. He's going to come for you too if you're ready. He's only getting those that are ready now, I'm telling you. Everybody else is going to get left. But those that are ready, He's going to receive unto Himself. The King is coming. Amen. Amen. You got your Bibles ready? I'll give you one more moment. Grab one out of the back of the pew if you don't have one. That's why we put them there. You have something to hold up over your head. The Bible is God's Word. It has authority in my life. The Bible changes me. I don't change the Bible. Amen. This is what the Bible says. Starting in Romans chapter 1, we'll be reading verses 28 through... Chapter 2, verse 4. Romans 1, starting in verse 28 through Romans 2 and verse 4. This is what the Bible says. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, He abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. You may think you can condemn such people, but you're just as bad, and you have no excuse when you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself for you who judge others do these very same things. And we know that God in His justice will punish anyone who does such things. Since you judge others for doing these things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that His kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? I'm thankful for the Word of God this morning, aren't you? Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. This is our third time together, looking at Romans chapter 1, now we're venturing into chapter 2, and the question that we're keeping at the forefront as we go through this passage is, what in the world is going on? Because as you read through this chapter and the next chapter, it's amazing how similar what Paul writes is to the days that we're living in. The things that are happening, things that are being blatantly paraded and pushed, things that were shameful, things that were kept hidden if they did occur, are now being forced upon the people of God. God 
God's word speaks very clearly about sin and against sin. And know this, Christian. God is against all sin. He, he is against all and every sin. Because it was all and every sin that brought about His Son going to the cross. It was every lie. It was every act of greed. It was every time that someone had lustful thoughts. It was every time that someone cheated someone else. Every time that someone disregarded the need that they could have and should have met. Every and all sin offends God. And he's very clear about this. What we find in scripture in this passage that we've been reading is that man is not offended by all and every sin. Man is the culprit. Man is willing to engage in all and every sin. And according to the word of God that we just read, man is even looking to invent new ways to offend God. Those are the times that we're living in. God still is pure and as righteous and as holy as ever before. And man just as wicked. And wanting to pursue that wickedness. Man just as unwilling to worship God as God. And so there is a dynamic that exists between sinful wicked man and holy perfect God. And it is this. God says if you worship me I will cleanse you. Purify you, sanctify you. I will heal you and help you and forgive you. And I will make you my own. But if you will not worship me, I will abandon you. If you will not worship me, if you refuse to accept me as God and worship me as God, I will abandon you. We wonder what is going on and then we wonder why, why is it that God seems to have abandoned people. And even entire nations, it seems like at times. I want to read you verse 28. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, that's the time we're living in right now. Man, in all of his intellectual prowess, has decided that it is now foolish to worship God. Man has surpassed, in his own estimations, the need for God. God was a crutch, an enabler, a patch, and now we've moved beyond that need. It's foolish from their point of view to acknowledge God. You better believe so very many people are at that place right now. Mentally, spiritually, emotionally, they seethe Against the notion of worshiping God. And not only do they think it's foolish for them to. They think it's foolish to allow you to. They think it's a foolish thing to allow you to worship God. And so they are doing everything in their power to discourage this worship. You say, uh, do you have proof of that, Pastor? Yeah, let me give it to you. Y'all remember this thing called COVID-19? This pandemic, right? And they, they went after the hairdressers first. I remember that. I went to the hairdressers that I knew and I prayed with them as they were getting ready to shut them down and take their livelihood. Went by one beauty shop after another and I, I felt horrible for what was happening. And I remember how they began to, to push and shut down other areas. And I, I thought, this is, this is alarming to me. Alarming. I hope it was alarming to you that, that a government could assume such power in such short notice. Now there's a reason why they started elsewhere because they didn't want it to seem like they were really just after one real problem. So they started elsewhere but finally they got to where they really wanted to get and that was the church. And across this country in different measures... They attempted to shut down the church of Jesus Christ. I, I remember, listen, how, how much more satanic than you, can you get than don't 
worship. Don't sing. Don't sing. Do not stand and sing. Somebody might get somebody's germs. Don't worship God. That was the whole point. The whole point. Now, it, it doesn't take a genius to figure this out. I'm not a genius. I figured it out. I'm thankful to say this church did not shut down. Our worship did not stop. We kept singing. We kept praying. Now, we did it outside, and God gave us good weather for however many weeks it was. But I want you to know the last thing that's going to happen is that some fool that doesn't want to worship God is going to influence me. The last thing's going to happen is some fool or foolish government that's going to try and get me to not acknowledge and worship God as God. And that's exactly what the effort is. And there's your proof, by the way. There's plenty more, but there's just a big chunk of it. You've lived through this. You see, they think it's foolish to acknowledge God. How do you think God's going to respond to that? How do you think God is going to respond, not only to someone that thinks he's foolish, and the notion of worshiping him is foolish, but someone who is actively trying to get others to stop worshiping him as well. Someone who is actively going to men and women, but especially children, and robbing them of the acknowledgement of God that they have innately. Telling them that that's just fairy tales and that doesn't belong. Somebody put that there. God didn't put it there. How do you think God is going to respond to this? The same and only way a righteous and holy God should respond to this. Don't question God's character. God, why would you do it this way? Because he's righteous and holy and everything that he does is right. Everything that he does is perfect. And so God says, in my holiness, I will abandon them. I will let them have all they can handle of their foolish thinking. I will let them do things that should never be done. That's the world we're living in right now. You got, listen to me. You want to talk about foolish things. Now here's, here's how upside down things are right now. Are you ready? They, they want to normalize an individual identifying as an animal. Do you understand? I hope you all aren't drinking this Kool-Aid. They want to normalize an individual made in the image of God, an eternal being. And they want to normalize that eternal being being coddled to and told that it's okay to identify as an animal. Surely you know this is foolish. I'm here to tell you, it's foolish. They are wanting to normalize. Here's, here's an idea of foolish thinking for you now. They want to make it normal for someone who is a born male to identify as a woman. I will let them do things that should never be done. In other words, in a God-fearing society, in a place where God is acknowledged and worshipped as God, that would not happen. Period. In a place where God is acknowledged and worshipped as God, you don't get people doing things that should never be done. In a society where God is worshipped because He's acknowledged as God, you don't get abandonment issues. But that's what this nation has. We've got some serious abandonment issues because we have forsaken God and in return He has abandoned us. And we are reaping what we have sown as a people. Reaping it. Now if any, anybody in here, listen, I love everybody in here. I love everybody out there to be honest with you. But if y'all think that any of this nonsense is okay, you need to get back in the Word of God. You need to get on your knees and pray that God would renew your mind and heart because you are being lulled to sleep by the enemy. By the enemy. That Christians would even for a moment tolerate these things as being normal. Or try and, try and maybe d discuss it. Or my, maybe we can figure this out. Or maybe we can come to a compromise. Or, or maybe, maybe, maybe we're wrong. No, honey. No, the, the church is not wrong because we're founded on the word of God. Let God be true and every man a liar. 
Church, we all know this. This isn't breaking news. I'm not up here telling you something you don't already know. If you're a follower of Christ, you already know all this. You know this is foolish stuff. What I'm up here to do is to tell you why God's word says it's happening. You, you, you know what's happening. You have the Holy Spirit of God. You have discernment. You can see what's going on. I'm just up here trying to put these pieces together so that you, from a spiritual perspective, can see why we are where we're at. That this is not just coincidental or this is not, well, things are going to get worse. Listen, listen. It's literally written out in Scripture that if an individual who then infects a community, who then infects a country, refuses to acknowledge God as God and will not worship God as God, then he's going to abandon them and these things are going to happen. God abandons them for these four reasons. I mentioned this last week, but I want to just mention it again this week because this is an itemized list from God as to here's what you do if you want me to abandon you. First, they're abandoned because they know the truth, but they suppress the truth. Then, they're abandoned because they won't worship God. Finally, they're abandoned because they turn their worship elsewhere because we will worship someone. And they worship idols. And that's the world we're living in right now. And it should seem upside down and crazy. It should seem foolish to the clear-minded Christian. It should seem utterly foolish. And if you are not astonished by the foolishness of the world around you, then again, you need to pray that God would help to transform your mind so that you can rightly see what's happening. You, you need to have on some, some clear lenses when you're looking at this world and what's going on in it right now. Because you've got to have clarity in your vision if you're going to have clarity in your action. I, I, listen, I don't want a, a blind surgeon operating on me. I want him to be able to see well. So if God is going to use you to operate in this world, you're going to have to have clear vision. Let's go to verses 29 through 32. Now there's going to be a list given. Before the list, I think, is really the key word, or maybe two words, that occur in these next four verses. The Bible says, their lives became full. Now that's an important, distinguished word there. It's not just that their lives were dabbled by. That their lives were tainted with. That some of these things began to show up. The Bible says their lives became full. Full of what? Every kind of wickedness. Sin. Greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. Before we move on, I just want to say, when you're talking about every kind, we've, we've figured out how to murder babies in their mother's belly. we figured out how to do it. we figured out how to dismember a baby in the womb. That's where we're at right now. There's, there's never been the level of greed that there is right now in America. You, you'd think that at some point we'd say, you know what, God's been real good to us. Let's start being good to others. But instead, the word that everybody says is more. Insatiable appetite for more. I'm just picking out a couple of these and giving very clear examples of what's going on in the world around us. Listen, you want to talk about an epidemic. Greed. There you go. The love of money. It's trying to infect even the people of God. The love of money. Revolving your entire world around a number. What a horrible way to spend this precious and brief life. 
I'm glad that God didn't revolve everything he did around a number. He revolved it around his love for us. I'm thankful for that. It says in verse 30, they're backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. <laughs> yeah, you're pretty boastful when you put a parade on, walk down the street without clothing. That's pretty, that's pretty, pretty boastful, isn't it? Just a little bit. It says they invent new ways of sinning. Yep. And they disobey their parents. That's an interesting tag right there, isn't it? You see what this is going back to is that it starts early. These aren't things that are just showing up late in life. When, when their lives become full, they are infecting their children at a young age to the point to where even the kids are responding to this unwillingness to acknowledge God. And the way that they show their being full is by disobeying the people that God has put in authority over them. This willful disobedience. It's not that I don't want to listen to you. It's that my teacher told me I don't have to listen to you. I, I'm not going to listen to you. What are you going to do about it? That's, that's where we're at right now. And by the way, it's not just parents. It's any person in authority. We've got some wonderful godly teachers in our church. Ask them how they're handling it in class. Stripped of any means to respond to this disobedience. A room full of children who are being conditioned by people whose lives are full of this. It's the snowball effect, church. That's what scripture is showing here. There's not just one sin that seems to stick its ugly head out and just, you know, this is the only problem we've got. Are you kidding me? It's this snowball that acts like a magnet. And as it goes, it picks up more and more. And we're even going to create new ways to offend God. Verse 31. They refuse to understand because they've already refused to acknowledge. They've already refused to worship. And they're going to refuse to understand. They break their promises. They, they, they have no worry about judgment or being held accountable. So their word means nothing. They are heartless. And again, we could just go back to the womb to see that, couldn't we? Heartless. And have no mercy. A willingness to commit atrocities on their fellow man. Whether you want to talk about slavery that's happening in Africa and Asia, or whether you want to talk about human trafficking that's happening right here in America. No mercy. Take full advantage of anyone and everyone that we can. No concern for the consequences. No concern for the, for the value of the individual that we are taking advantage of and harming and damaging. No concern whatsoever. That's the world we're living in. It says they know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die because they've got this thing called a conscience. It's becoming seared, but it's there. It says, yet they do these things anyway. And worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. That's the world we're living in. No doubt about it. That's where we are right now in America. You see, when your life is full of that which is ungodly, there's no place for God. We're getting to this tipping point where America's appetite is getting so full. We're, we're, we're being swollen with sin and and where's the room for God now where when are we going to have time for him when is he going to be recognized as God when's he going to be worshipped as God 
When you're full of sin, there's no place for God. And that's exactly what they want. They want to fill the bellies of our people with everything but truth. Everyone but God. I would ask you this question, what's filling your life right now? What is filling your life? What are you full of? Is your life filled with the things mentioned in the verses that we've just read? Greed? Envy? Are you, are you filled with a desire to only do what you want? To only bring yourself happiness? Are you full of this constant hunger for more? Something, just give me more of it. You see, our lives are supposed to be full, absolutely. But they're supposed to be full of God. Our lives are supposed to be marked by the one who has made us. Our, our lives are supposed to be full of things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Our, our lives are supposed to be full of mercy and compassion. Our, our lives are supposed to be full of holiness and separation and self-denial. Our lives are supposed to be full of saying the word no even to ourselves. Our lives are supposed to be full of light and salt we're supposed to be full. Absolutely, we were created to be full, but only to be filled by God. What's your life full of? Romans chapter 2. Paul is going to switch gears just a bit. You see, he's been laying out this divine indictment. Now, this is given from God. It's a divine indictment where God is saying this is happening and this is happening and here's why it's happening. They've done this and that's why I've done this. They've decided that they're going to do this and so I'm going to let them have this. God is laying it all out very clearly, fully justifying himself. He can't be blamed for what's happening in this world. And now the apostle is going to shift because it's easy to kind of get our, 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 in our crouch and, and in our, our, our spiritual posture and say, yeah, get them, God. And Paul says, you may think that you can condemn such people. <laughs> Wait, what? He says, but you are just as bad. Who's he talking to? Who's the letter written to? The church of Jesus Christ in Rome. He is, he is not speaking to lost people right now. Right now, he's speaking to us. He says, you may think that you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad, and you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself, for you who judge others do these very same things, and there it is. There it is. Those professing followers of Christ have lives marked by those who won't even worship God. We have the same issues in the house. Why is this? Is it because people aren't saved? No. He's not writing to lost people. He's acknowledging that these people are born again. They're followers of Christ. Yet he's saying this stuff's happening even in the church. I want to remind you that, that Satan's end game goal. It's not just to keep lost people lost. 
He wants to destroy the church. Why? Because we are the body of Christ. And if he cannot rob us of our salvation, which he can't, he can't, then he's going to do as much bodily harm to the church as possible. And one of the greatest ways to harm the church is to rob us of our testimony. Is to rip our reputation away. And that's what's happening. These same sins that start outside the church always want to find their way in. Paul says, be careful about how you're looking outside at others. Because a lot of that same stuff's happening in here. Christian, listen carefully to what the Bible says here. It says, when you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself. For you who judge others do these very same things. And we know that God, in His justice, will punish anyone. Now that's an intentional word. Anyone. Paul's saying, you know how you think that just those people that don't know God and won't worship God are going to get punished? I want you to know something. You're going to stand in front of him too. That's what Paul's saying. We don't like to hear that, but that's exactly what the Bible says. The Bible says that there's going to be a, a time of accountability for me too. And that I'm not just going to get to stand before him and say, boy, I'm so thankful that I accepted the blood because now, whoo, <laughs> I didn't want to have to answer for any of that stuff. There's going to be a moment I will stand before the Bema seat of Christ and I will give an account of what I've done as a Christian. From a moment of conversion, I will give an account. What did you do with the salvation I gave you? What did you do with the new life that I gave you? What did you do once you had the Holy Spirit living in you? What did you do once I began to grow you in your faith and reveal truth to you so that you could serve me better? What did you do? And I'm going to have to give an account. Well, I did some things well. But here's some things that I didn't do well. I will have to give an account Christian, our faith is not one that allows us to avoid all accountability. I'm sorry. Our faith actually demands that we be held accountable. And if you're in a position of leadership like myself, the Bible says, I will be held doubly accountable. We have to be mindful that if we're going to take a strong stand against sin out there, we better first take a strong stand against sin in here. In our own lives. Verse, verse 2 says, And we know that God in His justice will punish anyone who does such things. You see, God is just in all of His dealings. There'll be no finger pointing at God. We, we are going to be held accountable for what we do, for how we live, for the way we behave. The Bible says the Christian has no excuse for allowing sin to overwhelm them and run rampant in their life. Do you notice that Paul said in that verse 1 of chapter 2, he said, and you have no excuse. You want to know why? Because he knows who he's talking to. Christian, you're saved. Christian, you've been forgiven. You know what forgiveness feels like. Christian, you've got the Holy Spirit. Now, whether or not you're letting him lead, that's up to you, but you've got him. Christian, you've got the Word of God and the promises of God. Christian, you've got the people of God and the preaching of God's Word. Christian, you've got consistent worship. Christian, you've got prayer. Christian, you've got built-in spiritual accountability if you'll accept it. You've got a standard that you've been given 
as a follower of Christ, Christian. And so Paul very clearly says, you don't have an excuse. Like at least people who are far from God, they may not have this and they certainly don't have him living in them. They, they, they've got some handicaps going on. They, they don't have any help. But you've got the Spirit of God living in you. You're, you're a member of the family of God. You've been cleansed by the blood of God's Son. He says, you have no excuse. You see, Christian, God knows. He knows His people. He knows what He's done for His people. And He knows how His people are responding to what He's done. And the Bible is very clear. You and I are to live lives that are wholly separated from this world. We're supposed to look different, talk different, act different. We're supposed to treat others well. We're supposed to love like Jesus. We're supposed to make sacrifices not for our own benefit, but for the benefits of others. We are to look for ways to look like Jesus. Verse 4 says, don't you see, Christian, how wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that His kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Who is He talking to? The church. He's talking to us. He says, don't you see how good God's been to you? You don't want to respond to God's goodness the way that they have responded to God's goodness. You don't want to respond to God the way that people that don't know Him are responding to Him. You want to respond in a way that makes sense, not with foolishness, but with faith. He said, don't you see that God is patiently giving you time to repent? Patiently giving you time to live rightly in His sight? Patiently giving you time to avoid that which is evil? Patiently giving you time to live like you ought to live? It's what he's doing for you, Christian. You see, God knows these three things. And you need to know them too. Number one, the king is coming. Number two, judgment is coming. Number three, eternity is coming. And the Bible advises us that while we look at the foolishness around us, we forbid it from occurring in our own lives. While we see the degradation that is going on outside the walls, we keep ourselves and our fellowship pure. So Christian, the best way for you to respond to what's going on in this world is to repent for yourself. The very best way for you to respond to what's happening out there is to get right with God in here. His desire is to purify you so that He can use you. He's not interested in a tainted church. He wants a people who are keeping themselves for Him. A people who are devoted to Him. A people who want to respond to Him with worship. A people who are willing to repent of their own sin. Christian, don't leave here in clear judgment against others for their sin and having not repented of your own. Don't leave here looking down that nose at somebody else when you've not fallen on your face before a holy God and said, Lord, I repent of that which is in my life which ought not be. 
I repent of those things that I have done and am doing. I repent. I turn totally from my own sin. I fall down and cast myself at your feet and cry out for mercy. I'm so sorry, Lord, that I've responded to you in a way that doesn't make sense. All you've done for me, all of your kindness, all of your patience, I want to respond the right way. And the first thing I do is repent. I want to ask you to stand to your feet, please. You have that opportunity now. Be honest with God. I'm not asking for you to tell me anything. But maybe you need to tell God. Maybe one of the bigger problems that you're dealing with in your life is that you've been condemning and judging without repenting. How's God going to use you if there's no repentance? He's not called me to condemn and judge. I know He wants to use His people. But His people have to be prepared. Readied. Christian, can I encourage you right now? If there's anything that just seems foolish that you've been allowing in your life, repent of it quickly right now. What does it mean to repent? Lord, I am intentionally turning away from this and I am just as intentionally turning to you instead I'm not stepping away from sin I'm stepping in the direction of holiness towards you and so I'm distancing myself from what's been going on in my life Lord, I want to pursue you and your holiness. Lord, I want to be marked as one who belongs to you. I want people to see that I am rightly responding to you for what you've done in my life. Not with selfishness. Not with pride but with genuine worship, acknowledging you as God. So that those who are far from you will see that there's actually another way. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ here today. Lord, can I just pray very honestly for a purity in our lives. Lord, with all that's going on, it's so much easier to be drawn in. It's so much easier just to, to compromise. It's so much easier to give in. It's so much easier to do this. But Lord, you have called us to be different you've called us to stand our ground you've called us to hold to a standard you've called us to live lives of light you've called us to remain pure and to protect our purity whether it's in our homes in our marriages with our kids or in our jobs with our friends in the community wherever we are Lord we're yours and the world needs to see this because there's an adamant enemy, God, and you know this, who is 
trying to destroy. And Lord, you have put us here so that they might be saved, redeemed. Lord, I pray that your people would be a repentant people, quick to address our own personal sin, quick to acknowledge that we have not responded well to who you are and what you've done, quick to turn so that we can just have more of you. Because that's what we really need. And that's what we really want, Lord, is more of you. Jesus, we honor you with our prayer. We've prayed it by faith in your name alone. Amen. Amen. I like that song so good, we're about to sing it again. But i got a couple of announcements I need to make first. You can sing that one on your way out the door. Um, next week, we're going to have one outside service at 945. All right? Now, it may be warm. Surprise, surprise. It's August. All right? You, you bring your little sun umbrella, where you put your little sunblock on them ears. All right? Because we're going to worship outside one service at 945. We won't have an 820. We won't have an 11. We won't have Sunday school. We'll be outside for worship at 945. Now, if you were here during COVID, then you grew quite familiar with this because we did it. It's 20 some, about 30 weeks in a row, I know. It was, it was 30. And then we did it on and off after that as we were trying to figure out, you know, how everything else was going to work. But for those of you that have come since COVID, let me tell you something. If you've not been to one of these outside services, you're in for a treat. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. So you can bring a chair, bring a blanket, bring you snacks. Listen, please bring him young and something to drink. And babies are going to get thirsty out there in the sun. All right? Bring them some sweet tea or something like it. Bring me some deviled eggs. No, I'm joking about that. Don't bring any deviled eggs. Uh, but I did want to make that announcement. Uh, that's very important uh, so that you don't show up at 20 next week. You could get another hour of sleep, y'all. All right? Um, and there was another announcement. that Oh, it's the, the one about Faith Fest. So you can sign up to volunteer at our special friends tent at Faith Fest. The, the sign-up sheet's out in the breezeway. If you don't know where the breezeway is, uh, ask Pastor Chris. He'll be standing at this door. He can point you in that direction. Every year, our church sponsors uh, special friends at Faith Fest. So we will welcome and love and serve over 100 families who have an individual or multiple individuals with special needs in that family. They get free tickets. They get, it is. It's awesome. It's awesome. Praise the Lord. So they get free tickets. They get free parking. We feed them all day. We, we, literally, we serve them like at their beck and call. We bring them anything that they need. But it takes a pretty good-sized group of volunteers to do that. And so if you are willing to give a portion of your day, we're not asking you to be there all day. Um, you will get a ticket that will get you in all day. But we're only asking you to serve for a portion of time at Faith Fest. Please go over there and sign up, and uh, Miss Tracy will contact you with more information. Uh, but just consider doing that. How many of you have served at Special Friends before? A bunch of you. Awesome. Awesome. We'll sign up again. And then some of y'all other folks, you need to add to them. Because the more that we have, the kind of the shorter the times are that you have to serve. And so you've got more time just to kind of do your own thing and enjoy uh, Faith Fest. Okay? So I wanted to get the word out on that and let you know. Thank you so much. Uh, if you're here with us for the first time, listen, it's not that we, we love people who come. We have guests every service. And I know it may not seem like we cater to you, but I want you to know, it's really just because we're here for the Lord. I mean, I'm just being honest with you. We're going we're gonna to love everybody. But if you're here for the first time, welcome to Fair Plains. We're so glad you're here. I, if you've got any questions, feel free to ask me. I hope you'll come back. But know this, our, our heart's for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we show up to worship. And if you want to worship the Lord with us, you are so very welcome to. Because we're going to do the same thing next week. How's that sound? All right? But before you go, you got to get blessed. And you can give a blessing too, can't you? I said get blessed. Y'all keep your hands down. Somebody, <laughs> it goes both ways, y'all. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. 
and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace.